Yeah, so I mean, real estate was probably pretty accidental. I went to college not knowing what degree to get. And so uh, there was an accounting degree that sounded good because all the girls were in the accounting program. So I figured all the study groups would be a lot of fun. Yep. So and my buddies were all doing business ad. And I was like, business admin sounds boring and it's all guys. So I'm going to go over here and check it out. They interestingly had an accounting major with a real estate minor. So so I basically majored in girls and accounting and minored <laughs> in uh, real estate, which was really fantastic. Uh, no idea what uh, I was planning on doing with that. But in order to pass that course at the time, you actually had to pass the state exam. You didn't have to hang your license. You just had to pass. That was the final. So once oh, I got really? the license, yeah, it was the weirdest thing. So once I passed it, I was like, well, I might as well just hang it with somebody. So yeah, uh, it I so like happened that. that that's, that's way more versatile than the, like the test you're going to take. At least that's real world application. That's, yeah. I like that. It was the one course in college that had real world application. And that's cool. And I was thinking, man, they got to do more courses like that, where, you know, you're learning about something that's going to literally give you a paycheck. And so, yeah. So I hung it and I was, a, I think I was a junior at the time. And then, you know, and then I, I knew a bunch of upperclassmen just because of the social circle I was in. And so they're like, oh, you know, I got money. I want to buy my first house. I'm like, I have no idea what I'm doing, but I'll help you. And so yeah. I started selling houses in um, college and started making you know, pretty good money. I mean, 3% is not bad when you're a college guy. Oh, yeah. You lived off of 50 bucks a month on pizza and beer. And yeah. so when you actually get a check for like 1500 bucks, 2000 bucks. You're just like, what in the world is going on? I can actually eat like at a Denny's tonight. You know, it's like know. super exciting. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so that kind of got me started in real estate on that side. And then I bought my first house before I left college. I was 21. And uh, I just thought, well, I should probably you know, invest some of those funds. So I bought a house and then I made it like a fraternity. I had seven of my buddies live in it. It smelled like a locker room. Uh, kitchen was absolute disaster. Girls never wanted to come over because they always felt compelled to clean because it was such a mess. Like, yep. you know, your house is bad when girls come over and don't just comment on it, but they come over with buckets in hand because they <laughs> tend to actually sanitize before they actually sit in the house. So I was like, man, this isn't, this isn't going super good, but... I discovered accidentally house hacking, which is, you know, renting out all the rooms to your buddies. And I was profiting 500 a month after all utility expenses. And so that kind of got me hooked. And, and uh, from there, I think real estate has always just been something that I've done. I've taken on other, you know, part-time jobs here and there just to try to do stuff here and there. Uh, but just, just discovered that I just, I'm not a good W2 employee. Like I'm, I suck at working for other people. Um, yeah. and I think you guys do the same. That's why you're an entrepreneur. <laughs> yeah. I was just talking to somebody the other day and they were, they're in like the biz, they're an accountant. So they're in a busy, uh, year end push at their company. And she works for like a bigger, um, retail store. And, uh, she's like, well, I have to wait for this department to get me all their stuff, but I'm at home. And I was like, man, do you remember the days where you had to go into the office and sit there for eight hours, whether you had work to do or not? Right. Like that seems so foreign to me that yeah. you're sitting in a building all day. Yeah. And painful. Well, and I painful. still have buddies that work in W2 careers and, you know, and I don't want to knock them for it. You know, I just, but at the same time, I'm like, okay, so if we go on a trip, we have to go figure out when your employer will let you have 10 days off because all you have is 10 days. And yep. then we got to figure out how to stream your sick days. And then we got to lie for four other days after that to get, you, th <laughs> you know, three weeks. And it's like, why do you have to live like that? Like when you're an entrepreneur, it's like, hey, you know what? Today it's a sunny day. I'm going out on the boat, you know? Yep. And I'll answer emails while I'm driving on the boat. And in between yep. steers, we're going to check a couple of our emails. And, you know, that's, that's I think, the most exciting thing about real estate investing and, and doing what we do is that that freedom and, and financial freedom is one thing, absolutely. But yep. I think the time freedom, uh, yeah. especially when you've got young kids, like I, I don't miss my kids' soccer games. I don't miss, you know, any of the things that I want to be at because- yep you know, the freedom's there. Yep. I just coached my son's baseball team this summer because nice. I could like, it's busy, but like, you can always take time out and it's not like I have to, all right, I got to leave work early today and then hope that they're okay with it. It's just, you're able to make your schedule what you need to make it. And it all works yeah. out. And obviously big kudos to the guys that are holding up the fort while I'm gone. Cause we yeah. do have a team of, of five guys working on various projects at the time. So uh, big shout out to the foreman and the guys keeping the, the train rolling as I'm out. Oh, hundred percent. Yeah. Teamwork is uh, such a critical part of it. But I mean, the truth is, is that you probably still work over 40, 50, 60 hours oh, a week. Yeah. It's flexible. Yes. I work way more now than I did at W2. 
but yeah. my hours are when I need to work. And so, I mean, you have the late nights, but if you have the late nights, it's probably because you took some time off during the day to do what you need to do. Yeah. So, or you've got an exciting project that you're awake because you're super stoked about, you know, and you're yeah. just like, oh, I love this. This is great. You know, as opposed to two in the morning sitting at an office trying to reconcile some statement for an employer that doesn't care anyways, you know, and you're just like, that, yeah. that's, that's lame. But yeah. But, but again, like you said, kudos to those who carry W-2 jobs. I mean, that's that's the majority. Oh, yeah of where our country is at. I think, I think even for W2 workers, I tell everybody all the time, like you can still experience a tremendous amount of the real estate investing world, even as a W2 worker and enhance yeah. the financial freedom and, and some flexibility. Because then if the employer says, hey, I can only get you two weeks paid, you're like, all right, I'm going to take two months and the rest is unpaid. No problem. Yeah. Yeah. And as I long as you have that backup. I started with a line. I do W2 and I do this stuff on the side with Marcus. Um, so it's it's an interesting world to get back into a W2 job. I don't know if I like it as much as yeah. <laughs> I think your That's boss the problem. Is freelance is way better. Yeah. 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 Freelancing is way better. I I love it. But yeah, yeah. It's kind of like once you taste the Detroit pizza, you can't go back to like, you know, Pizza Hut after that. You know, it's like yeah. I can't go back to my W2. I got to you know definitely have that flexibility so right. yep. right. Right. so have you ever held a w-2 or have you i mean it sounds like out of college you went right into uh the investing world yeah i mean i tried i tried to do a marketing you know thing for a while and then i tried to do uh you know i just i did a number i'm entrepreneurial so i also just love seeing how companies work so i did take on some different roles and and every single time it just was like it's it's great but the stress just didn't satisfy to the degree the stress in real estate investing satisfies. Yeah. Because there's stress no matter what, you know? And when people yes. on Instagram make, you know, house flipping seem so easy and, you know, oh, you know, real estate investing is going to make you all this money and it's no stress. I'm just like, no, I don't know what world you're living in because yeah, it's stressful. And but that's the one reason I liked, uh, I gravitated towards bigger pockets when I started with real estate. Cause yeah. I was carrying my W2 when I started with real estate and I got my agent license and I was listening nice. to that podcast while I was on the road. Cause I drove like three and a half, four hours a day wow. just to get to the next, like all collectively by the end of the day, four hours. And I'm like, I was wasting four hours of my day listening to music. Like I got to yeah. find something like long-term career wise. And then I, I, I jumped onto bigger pockets and I think it was their first show and their intro like if you want, if you don't want the fluff and you want to know what it really is, this is not like a vacation. This is work. Yeah. But if you can get through that, like this will be for you. And I was like, perfect. Someone who's not going to lie to me about like, yeah. if you sign up for this training course, we're going to make sure you make like $6,000 your first month. Like, right. Bullshit. Right. But these bigger right. pockets, they're like, this is what you got to do. Here's the plan. It's going to be stressful. It's going to be work. But if you stick with it, it'll pay off. And I mean, I've tried to follow the, the people who've done it before, I don't try to recreate the wheel. If you, if you have a problem, someone else has had that problem. You just yeah. have to learn from what they've done. So, yes. I mean, leaning on people who've done it before and not being nervous to, I mean, get out and try it is a, is a big thing. And once you get over those hurdles, then yeah, you see the fruits of what it can be. Yeah, no, a hundred percent. And that's what I love about the community of real estate investors, not just in bigger pockets, but just even like through relationships like this, you start to realize like everybody in this space loves to help each other, which is yeah. really unusual. Like it's unique. You know, it is. It's like, we were talking about football. It's like not, not in the football space. Do you see that? You know, yeah. at, at training, everybody's competing to try to get the position or get that yep. check. And um, you know, with real estate, there's just so much opportunity that I think anybody, especially if someone's listening now and just kind of considering real estate and worried about failing and, and there's not enough opportunity in the space, that's so far from the truth. But like, yeah. especially as the market starts to change right now, like recession equals opportunity to me. Um, yeah. And so it's pretty exciting. Isn't that Warren Buffett that says he buys when people are scared? Like yes. when people <laughs> run, he buys. Yeah. And that's yeah. the same thing. Like right now is the time to go out and and do it because everything is changing yeah are you guys buying more now because of the economy and, and the changes right now well right now we're trying to finish up the few projects we have so we can go out we just bought a property um this is another this is something where you buy it and it's supposed to be one thing and then it it completely flips on you right so we bought a property about a month ago and um we're trying to finish up a project so we haven't even stepped foot in it we we got it from a wholesaler 
Uh, it was a good price. We know we can add a garage, add value to it and, and make money on it. Um, about two weeks after we closed, we got a notice from the city saying that, hey, we detect your water meter hasn't shut off. And there was a little leak and uh, it turned out to be a bigger leak than what we thought. And the toilet upstairs was running all the way down through the walls into the basement. So now we have to go in and rip out drywall and refloor some areas. And so it was supposed to be a quick flip that turns right. into, hey, we got some demo to do. And our numbers yeah. switched a little bit. Our, uh, our direction that we're going to take it has changed a little bit. But again, we're, we're big enough to hold our own, but we're still small enough to maneuver quickly. Yeah. So. Yeah, it's uh, yeah, it's a problem, but I mean, it's a I could have other problems. This is oh, not a problem that I'm going to make a problem. Right, right, right. Well, I think that's the number one rule with house flipping that I've discovered is that the only thing constant is the unexpected. Yep. Like I, I don't think it, I don't, it, we've done two hundred, maybe fifty flips by now, and I'd say every single one. When you, it's always funny to look at the scope of work initially and the initial budget. And then what we thought we'd do. And then we look at the end and it's just like every single time it's not. Yep. The same. Yeah. So now we just hold it loosely on the front end and we're like, I think we're going to do this as long yep. as the margin's there, then we got lots of buffer to either make more money or, or even if we screw this whole thing up and we yeah. have a flood, we can still at least, you know, walk away and not be totally dead. Yeah. And there's yeah. actually a book out there and I'm forgetting the name of it, but I'm pretty sure I bought it on Amazon, but it goes through as you're flipping a house, some of the costs that go into each facet of it, and then the the, nas the national average of cost per project. So like okay. if you're gonna put in a driveway, it'll give you the national average of what it would take to put in a yeah. driveway at a certain size. You can flip through all these different electrical, plumbing, masonry, framing, like anything you'd want. And that helps with estimating. So yeah. again, not even like I'm pulling numbers out of thin air, I'm going to this book, that has syndicated over the whole nation to yeah. get rough numbers. So it, again, it's not recreating the wheel. Yeah. They've done it yeah. before, just go find the answer. Right, 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 exactly. Which is so smart because I mean, sometimes you just don't know. Right. And I'm curious with Hawaii, obviously everybody listening to the show is like, okay, he invests in Hawaii, so expensive. How do you do it? When you're in Hawaii and obviously you go in Seattle and Vegas as well, what is, what's your biggest, is there a big difference from Hawaii to the other areas that you invest in? Or was there a certain reason why you picked Seattle and Vegas other than you like to travel there that like made it more, all right, I like those areas. I'm going to invest in them because of this reason. Like what yeah. went into your, your thought process as you're developing your whole business plan and in, in going into those markets? I love it. I love it. Well, I mean, I think there's person, there's part intentionality and part like just life happens and then opportunity opens doors. So yeah, uh, we started in Hawaii and we started flipping homes there. Great opportunity because there's a lot of what we call plantation homes in Hawaii. So they're like one, one panel, uh, there's no drywall. It's just a single panel uh, type of a construction and you got louver windows. And so those are just not as popular these days, but man, that was the construction of the day back in like the seventies. And so those okay. are easy to flip because you come in, put some drywall on, you get some nice new windows on the yeah. kitchens. And, and so that became our bread and butter. Uh, Hawaii is an international market. So we got people coming from all over the world buying. I mean, literally not just the, the United States, but all over the world. So it makes it for a real strong economy. And, and unfortunately that has pushed the pricing up. So the average or median house price in Hawaii now is over $850,000 for just a small 1400 square foot starter home. Dang. Uh, and that's just not that's not feasible for most people to live yeah. in Hawaii. Uh, and so and then it's for investors, it's kind of risky because you're trying to buy a, a tear down piece of crap for six hundred and fifty thousand. It's put a tough pill to swallow. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's quite a big it's a big pill to swallow for a lot of people, especially coming from different parts of the country. And so, I mean, we were buying, you know, old houses that needed full guts, uh, but in good areas for like $1.2 million in the hopes yeah. that we would sell for 2 million after we were done. Uh, fortunately, we had some good experiences. Other times we had horrible experiences. Um, so, you know, it just kind of goes here and there. But as we were taking a look at other parts of the country and investing in different places, uh, I liked Seattle because Seattle has so many corporate offices, Microsoft, Amazon, Costco, REI. I mean, there's so many. So the yep. economy in Seattle is just so strong. And throughout COVID, it was just like there was no hiccup. The market was just soaring. 
Yeah. So from a multifamily perspective, we own quite a few apartments here in the Northwest uh, because the rents are super strong because of the economy being so strong. Yeah. So, so I really like the buy and hold side. Vegas is fun because the entire world goes to Vegas. I mean, yep. Vegas is just, it's a market that when you uh, look at conferences these days, I think the number one country or number one place in the country for conferences got to be Vegas, right? Yeah. And so for us, that was a great market to invest in. So we thought, hey, let's buy some units here. And so that was great. And then now we just, um, I'm closing on 41 units in Houston next week. Uh, and That's then another Dallas. good area. Yeah, Houston, Dallas is awesome. So we just moved our construction company to be based out of Houston. Uh, it was based out of Seattle. So now we've moved the offices down to Houston uh, okay. literally weeks ago. And so uh, that's a market where we could still buy uh, doors, which is like a two bedroom unit. So we call it a door. So if there's eight units, it's eight doors. So we could still buy like in, a, in our 41 unit, we're buying each unit for $73,000, which is- okay really great because yeah. rents are like a thousand dollars a door that's awesome uh, for vegas right now they're more like 125 to 150 a door and then same with washington you're probably about 125 ish a door so kind of more expensive but houston and dallas you can still get a great deal per unit with high rents yep so, so that's what's kind of moved us around the country michigan actually i was trying to buy a fire station in flint just because yeah what were you going to do with that you mentioned that before we started recording i was going to ask you about that what yeah. was the plan with the fire station I'll have to send you some photos. I bought a fire station here in Seattle. The city was selling a fire station that was super cool. And, and so when, when opportunities opened the doors, I was like, man, this is just not in my space. I don't know what to do with a fire station, but damn, that sounds cool. Yeah. So I picked it up for $730,000 uh, and then sat on it through COVID. So, I mean, that talk about a renovation that you know didn't go as planned. It yep. took me ever to figure it out because it was a commercial building. I wanted to make it residential because the city wouldn't let me. I wanted to do a bar. I was trying to do all kinds of cool things, but the city wouldn't allow it. They said you could make it a residential or you could keep it a fire station. And I'm like, who else is going to want to rent a fire station for a fire station? Yeah. So I had to convert it to residential. So we did a massive conversion and we finally sold it for just under 1.8. So we made okay. a really healthy chunk of money, yeah. on it, but had so much fun. Like, I mean, we did red kitchen cabinets, red interior doors. I mean, just the stuff that nobody else would do in a regular house. Right. Yeah, we, we did. And it was, I'll send you some photos or yeah, yeah I want to see that. look that it up cool. online. Yeah, it was, it was super fun. So after that, I was like, I need to go buy every fire station available in the country. And That's so uh, one of our team members was looking and they're like, hey, you know, your wife's from Michigan. Uh, there's a fire station in Flint. And so I was like, let's put an offer on it. So we got it for 200,000 bucks. Uh, in Michigan. That's awesome. So, so yeah, so super fun. And so we're and you haven't started that renovation yet. That's two, that's two. Well, we, well, we, we were in due diligence for three months and then we were trying to figure out how to, to renovate it. I really wanted to make a food hall and a special event center. Yeah. Uh, but in Flint, the economy is so repressed, but construction costs are so high, as you know, right now, yeah. it was going to take $3 million to renovate that fire station. Dang. which would have completely blown the comps. Like there's yeah. not a single sane investor in the world who would be yeah. like, oh, I'll give you $3 million for that when you're done. Like it wasn't going to be worth that. Yeah. So reluctantly, I had to back out of it. Uh, and so I'm just going to hang tight and maybe somehow uh, I'm going to, I'm working with the city to see if they'll give us some grants because that's another thing for investors. If you're looking at unique spaces, Sometimes cities will actually give you money because they want that space renovated for a certain purpose. Yep. So if our purpose has to do with the community, bringing a gathering place, uh, helping out after school programs, you know, so if we could tie all that in, uh, we were going to be able to get maybe one to $2 million. Wow. Yeah. And suddenly that budget totally changes, you know? So, and, and, and it's still sitting for sale because there's nobody else in town that's going, Ooh, let me go spend 3 million on a, on a fire station. But yeah. But it changes your numbers completely. There was a couple buildings in Oconomowoc where me and Natasha lived that in our downtown strip area, they'd sold the building. Um, so under new ownership within the sale, they got a grant from the city to do the exterior. So all new windows, all new brick, because they wanted to match the facade of the old historic downtown. That's so awesome. the city took on the cost of all the exterior and the roof and all they had to do was renovate the interior. Which again, if you're saving the cost of doing all the exterior work, like that changes your budget and what you can do with the building completely. Yeah. Um, After that, you should have bought up the whole block. I know. 
<laughs> well, someone did come in and buy the block, and now they're oh, going to okay. turn that into condos. Yeah. Yeah. I'd be so like, it's hey, all changing. You're going to do half the budget. And yeah. it's it's like a give and take. You're going to find that as you get into it. So they, on the one part that they're going to buy, and it was uh, like a watercraft, like uh, paddle boards and kayaks and knee boards and all that stuff. They had a pet store. They had a bar because you can't have... <laughs> They're you can't not have a bar in Wisconsin. Now? What's that? Are turning those into condos now too? Yeah. So what they're That's doing, awesome. the city is allowing them to turn it into condos because they obviously like we live around lakes and they want lake access for the public. So they're giving them the allowance to convert it into residential, but they're taking the shoreline. So the shoreline is going to be taken into the city so that they can put a walking path and like another shoreline activity area around it. And that's what they've pretty much done with all the new buildings is they they give up some, but then they take the shoreline for public, which that's is, awesome. I mean, a cool trade-off. All the residents still get their piers and they can house their boats there. So it's kind of a win-win for everybody, except if you've lived there forever and hate change. Right, right, right. But I don't know. That sounds exciting to me. Let me know if there's a, an extra place I can park a boat. I'll come join you. Absolutely. There's always boat slips <laughs> available. Yeah. yeah, that sounds awesome. Especially and it'll get, get you to Wisconsin. I know. That's the only problem is that you only use your boat one day of the year, right? But other than that, yeah, <laughs> the one day a year, it's good enough to go out there. Yeah, and you're and the one day is right behind you right now, man. That, those skies are amazingly blue. That's oh, it's I'm nice. Like. It's eighty degrees and sunny, wow. so I can't complain with a nice little breeze off the lake. Yeah, can't complain at all. It probably doesn't beat Hawaii because you're getting this every single day right yeah but <laughs> it's different in hawaii though but yeah 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 totally but i mean in wisconsin when you can get a sunny day like that in 80 degrees man everybody doesn't it. show up for work everybody's on the water everybody's sick for some reason it's weird yeah it's weird All in one day pandemic. it's a <laughs> pandemic man you have to watch out <laughs> but so, that's awesome so you have a construction company that's based in wisconsin and then serving yep. pretty much what you guys do yeah i haven't i have i'm gonna be honest long distance investing scares me still so yeah. like kudos to you for going long distance that's something that i've not bitten off yet i'm interested in it like we want to go um southern california texas florida those are like my my yeah. target areas but whenever i get to them yeah. it'll be it'll be the right time whenever i get there um yeah. but yeah, i would just suggest that just uh, if you pick out one of those markets that you really like and personally i would pick out the market that you feel like you would enjoy traveling to Yep. You know, so maybe it's Florida because, you know, it's kind of a fun place outside of Wisconsin in the wintertime. Yep. And, and I would just say, just start networking, wholesalers, you know, meeting people. And then pretty soon somebody's going to send you a deal that you're like, hey, this is too good to be true. Yep. And then once that deal hits your plate, um, you know, it sounds like we're a lot alike. Like you'll figure out a way to make the deal work. And then you're going to figure out a way to build the construction team. And then you're going to figure out yep. a way how to, you know, fly down there so you can manage it. And so eventually the the uh, plan kind of comes together yep. and, and it sounds like you guys you're, you're very similar to us we kind of uh fire and then aim and figure stuff out later yeah uh, other people are like oh you know we got to evaluate every market we got to build teams and we got to interview contractors and property managers i'm like man that take forever i don't want to make it that confusing it doesn't yeah. have to be that confusing yeah well and then the and then the analysis paralysis comes in because yes. then suddenly it's like, oh, you know what? I'm not ready yet because I don't have a good property manager. You know, hey, if you don't have a good property manager, manage it yourself, right? From a distance. Yep. I mean, sometimes I mean, Natasha, I talked to Natasha and, and she has been a co-host on the show talking to other investors to yeah. get into the investing world. And her first, her first investment was out in Portland. Nice. And they, they took a little vacation out there to vet different, I think it was three property managers, right? Yep. yep. So, I mean, and you already bought the property, right? Right. And we're so next year, I think we're going to purchase our second house out in Oregon. It'll be on the nice coast. on the coast, though. I need my house. This is Jason's yeah. house. My house is going to be on the coast. The coast but yeah, so a, a non investor going in buying a house, we're going to figure out the property management stuff. It's, it's there. We'll figure it yeah. out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Natasha, let us know if you need help. Our, our team is licensed in Oregon. Oh, awesome. Yeah, I would love it. We we haven't decided where on the coast yet. We've gone out um, the seaside once. We're going out to um, 
Oh no, we went to Florence and now we're going to Seaside this year. So we're kind nice. of making our way up and down the coast, finding where we really want to first. Yeah, yeah. Seaside's beautiful. Lincoln City's another one to go I, check out. That's my husband really likes. Um, yeah. But again, it's my, this is going to be my, <laughs> my this, is where, this is I where I'm going to die one day. So <laughs> if you're going to die anywhere, Oregon coast ain't so bad. I, right? I know. The weather's. <laughs> That's awesome. That's yeah. awesome. Well, that's so fantastic. What, Let us know. what is next on your, your, uh, venture? Like you've gone, are you going other areas or are you trying to maximize the areas you're in now? Cause you have your team set up. Like I'm thinking you just moved to Houston. Yeah. Are you now going to flood Houston? Like now you've got all the support made. Are you trying to flood that market or are you still looking to expand into other areas? Like, is it, is the world your oyster and you're like, wherever the deal takes me? I, uh, so I'm going to try to beat you to Florida. So we're trying to get, we're going to be the race is on the race is on bro. Um, yeah, no, I really want to be in Florida. I just, I love it there. We have some family and, um, I've got to go down there in a couple of weeks as well. So I'm just kind of looking South beach area. And then I also like the uh, Gulf side of the state. So checking out that market. So we kind of do, so a little bit like you, so we have a real estate team that's licensed. So we have agents yeah. basically in every single one of these states that are part of our team. And then we also have a hard money lending company. So we're able to fund the deals. And then we also, that's based out of Honolulu. Then we have a construction company and we also have a property management company. So we basically created all these companies to support our addiction of real estate flipping. Yep. And, and we are once we got, yeah so we're very similar and so all of our companies supported that but along the way you know like the natasha's come into your life and they're saying hey can you help me and so yep. we started having our buddies so now we do a little podcast uh, a live podcast every friday in fact is that one o'clock today where yeah, nice. a lot of like about 80 investors come together and it's just a live conversation having coffee and so a lot of people are just like hey help me think through this or how do i do this and so when we kind of talk through that so now a lot of our companies are geared towards helping other people build their portfolios. That's so, awesome. So it's been fun. So what's nice is that now, and you may even think about this, is that because we're always sourcing deals, if it's a really good deal, like just the other day, a gal called and was like, hey, I need to dump my triplex. And it's actually in Washington. And uh, I ran the comps and I knew what I'd be willing to pay. And she gave me a number, which was less than what I wanted to pay. I'm like, wow, this is great. And yeah. so she's like, can I go on market? I'm like, you know what? I think I'm just going to buy it. She's like, what, really? I'm like, yeah, I think, that, I think that'd be great. So what's nice is that if I like it, I can buy it. If I don't like it, then, and it's a decent deal, I can sell it to one of our partners. So we have a lot of investors will be the agent, make the commission on it and help them yeah. out. But then our construction team will make money because we're going to help them renovate. Our property management company is going to make money because we'll manage it. And then if they use our lending company, we make money on the lending side. So it's kind of fun. That's awesome. So now we've created this really large, almost like a consulting business for new investors. Um, yeah. Majority actually, because of word of mouth, are all physicians. So we work with a lot of doctors around the country. Some of them yeah. I've never met, but I keep spending their money and <laughs> keep building their portfolio. In fact, one thing that, um, have you ever heard of real estate professional status? No. Oh, bra, you got to write that down and look it up on Google. It'll change okay. your life. Uh, real estate professional status. So for anybody who's listening or hasn't heard it, it's actually a, it's not a tax loophole. It's on the front page of your 1040. You should be claiming it because basically if you do a certain number of hours, about 700 hours a, a year in real estate, you're able to write off a good portion of your W-2 income. So for doctors, you know, they've got massive W-2 incomes and they're paying massive yeah. amounts of taxes. So when we build their portfolio, their passive income allows them to one day retire out of their doctor income. But in the meantime, through depreciation, something called accumulated depreciation, accelerated depreciation, you know, all of that put together, uh, we're able to help them in some cases pay zero W-2 taxes. So all the money they would have given the government, they're actually buying more assets. So That's it's, awesome. it's phenomenal. But it also works for people like you and me, who um, you just pay yourself a W-2 through one of your LLCs, yep. and then now your uh, income can be washed through that. So that's kind of become our new passion is to help, you know, just normal people like us who are just trying to get started, save some money, raise a family, have money for our kids, because by the time our kids go to college, it'd be like a million dollars a year. Yeah. You know? So we're trying to just, you know, grow together type of thing. So yeah. yeah and there's a lot of the people that, that make that money that, I mean, they're consumed with their job. A yeah. doctor 
Now they could, but more often than not, a doctor is not going to sit down and analyze deals when they get done with work. Like they want a resource like that, that can help them place the money. They don't want to do the legwork to it. That's and right. if you can place their money and then manage their money or their property, yeah. like they're more than likely going to be in with all the tax savings and extra money yeah. they can have in savings. So 100%. that's a really cool niche little like market. Um, in the healthcare, one of the things that I've been looking at is Airbnbs because those are always interesting. And if you do go long distance, you can Airbnb. So I yeah. picked up a property in Florida, you Airbnb that out. And there was one thing I was looking at, and there's a website, and I can't recall it, but it's for traveling nurses. Yep. So you don't actually sign a contract with the actual individual. You'd sign it with the company that places the nurses or doctors right. that travel. Yep. And they would always constantly run it or completely fill your, your rooms. Yep. And I was like, that's a super, like, I never even thought of that as an option. Yeah. But yeah. Huge. I mean, there's always answers to problems of what you want to get into and yeah. Um, it doesn't sound like your Airbnb yet. A lot of yours is still long-term rentals for the buy and holds. Uh, no, we do Airbnb as well because that real estate professional status is even better with Airbnb. Oh, really? Uh, yeah. You can get a much bigger chunk of tax write-offs in the year of the acquisition of the Airbnb. So long is as that just because there's more hours to it, like more um, management hours? You just have to be hands-on for, I think it's a hundred hours, before, you know, in that tax year. Okay. Um, so are, yeah, it just. Are your Airbnbs as much of a headache as the Airbnbs I manage? <laughs> so, so the Airbnb, yeah, that's a whole topic by itself. Yeah. The Airbnb industry is changing drastically. I think it soared because of COVID. So then everybody started buying them. Yeah. It's kind of like gas prices are going up. Everybody's buying a Tesla right now. And so it's just this little weird kind of a fad, I think, in some ways. It is a good investment. The hard part about Airbnb is exactly, Natasha, what you said, right. uh, is the turnover. I mean, you're a hotel. And exactly. It's the hospitality. that We were kind yeah. of talking about this uh, in a previous podcast that we were on because the Airbnb side, that's my W-2 job. And it's, oh, okay. it's a big, big headache. Um, just Huge. because it is hospitality versus renting out a, you know, a long-term rental. Yeah. Yeah. So exactly that. And then the wear and tear, you're going to get a partying tenant. You're going to have neighbors that'll complain. Yep. And then what's tough is that a lot of people love to go into those areas to buy an Airbnb that does not have a lot of regulations yet, mm -hmm. which is good. But as, as so long as those neighbors continue to complain, regulations are around the corner. Yep. And what's going to happen is this Airbnb that you know was doing so well now becomes this non-business and then you're sitting on this asset. So I'm not anti-Airbnb. What, what I've tried to do is buy Airbnb in such a way that it could be, um, just like you were saying, Marcus, a midterm rental or a long-term rental. So if you're able to get multiple exit strategies, uh, so what we've been looking at is old motels that got shut down during COVID in really okay. good locations. Traveling nurses love being near big hospitals. Yep. And if you drive yep. around big cities, you're going to notice a bunch of those little, you know, like Motel 60 kind of a thing where it's yep. near town, not the best part of town. Some of them were in pretty good parts of town, never got torn down and they shut down. And so we've been looking at, we looked at one in Oklahoma City that was in a good part of town. But what's nice about that is <clears throat> you've got like say 80 doors or 80 units. If you can put kitchenettes in there, or tear down a wall and make them one bedroom suites out of two rooms, then you can sign a deal with traveling nurses. There's also, we talked about NFL. NFL sometimes does long-term temporary housing for trainers, coaches, you know, some players. Oh, yeah. that out. So lots of cool midterm. And what's nice about midterm is it's not like every other day, right, Natasha, where you're like, where's the toilet paper and who freaking stole the iron? And, oh, how come there's a stain on the bed? And you're just like, right. oh my gosh, like, I'm not, I'm not freaking your mom. I'm not right. going to come over and do your laundry, you know? And so, but midterm rentals gives you a little bit less turnover and more control because you're able to control the contract with traveling nurses or NFL, right. uh, Microsoft, you know, those big companies nearby. Mm -hmm. And but no one talks not, about those midterms. Like that's a, that's kind of a, a smaller, smaller fraction of a market. Cause I, I would assume that there's harder um, scheduling for the next tenant to come in because obviously with long-term, you try not to get them to move out in the Midwest in the winter. Cause no one likes to move in the winter. Right. Like, do you have those nuances with those mid middle range rentals or are those still constantly flowing like Airbnbs are? 
Yeah, you're, you're spot on. Location, proximity, and the demand is huge. So, you know, like even in Vegas where it's very hot, the dynamic there is you're competing against hotels with full service. So if you're Airbnb, yep. you got to offer something that's pretty special. Uh, and there's a lot of uh, big resorts that'll do nurses for pre- fairly cheap. But the difference is nurses don't want to park in the parking garage and take 20 minutes to go from the parking garage to their room, no matter how cheap it yeah. is. But those casinos are like two zip codes, you know? And so yep. traveling nurses at the end of their day, they're just like, hey, I need a quiet place, a fun place. One of the models that we're thinking of doing is trying to get, we're buying a complex of like um, tiny homes, almost like tiny units. That's and then cool. turning that, they're right now existing. They're kind of like a traveling motel type of a thing. So we're going to gut the whole thing and just make it a traveling nurse complex because it's walking distance to the hospital. Oh, nice. So That's the whole cool. thing will be gated. The whole thing will have, you know, fun colors. It's going to have a cool central vibe area because a lot of these traveling nurses are coming from all over the country. They got no friends. They show yeah. up in Houston and they're just like, you know, I'm scared, but I don't want to spend a ton of money on rent because I'm trying to save money. So imagine if you could go to a place where you're meeting other traveling nurses. So like-minded, like-hearted, it's secure. You got a place to meet some folks. And then it's like, Hey, you know, I've got a couple of friends that I can go out to the bar with and, and so we're trying to really niche down into really like traveling nurses or um, here in Seattle, there's a, the, the Seahawks practice in a certain part of Renton and there's a lot of multifamily buildings. So I was actually trying to buy one of them that had 15 units and turn it into a Seahawks uh, campus. So all of the awesome. bench warmers that don't get paid a ton of money, they get like 30 to 40 grand a year just to be part of the practice team. Yeah, like they're, they're needing to rent. So yeah. instead of renting anywhere else, we give them a really cool deal and they've got a, you know, it's going to feel like a big frat, but you got your own little apartment. So That'd to me, fun. that's a, that's a great way to do like short term rentals, but with a little bit more midterm feel. Yeah. And then you make the connections with your favorite team. And you, get to the players. you know, get some free seats, you know, <laughs> maybe get some autographs, but of course they're bench warmers. So it's kind of like autographs for who, you know, <laughs> I mean, they know the other people they'll help yeah. you out. Hopefully. Yeah. It could, work out. it could work out. That's yeah. a super yeah. cool, like that, that's the first person that I've heard actually going after like a professional league and all of those people. Cause like you think about in baseball, they've got, I mean, triple a down to rookie ball. You've got bullpen catchers that can't, they can't live like starters or all stars. Right. So there's always that it's such a big disparity in, in hierarchy and pay. Yeah. So yeah, you can do that with the Packers. Just go up yeah. to the, go figure out what the Packers needs in terms of housing. And uh, you well, they up- go up to um, St. Norbert's college, which is in like central Wisconsin. And oh, they okay. practice up there for spring training. So I think they take over the dorms. Nice. If I'm not mistaken, I think they take over the college dorm while the college kids are out, oh, which that makes sense. I mean, do professional athletes want to live in a dorm? Probably not. No, not at all. <laughs> we have to figure out like if they can live off site. I don't know how they all work it. Yeah. Cause yeah. I feel like the Packers are really weird and they're very close, like close knit. They want everybody to live in the same area, at least in spring, like the, what do they call that offense? Yeah. yeah. Kind of like spring training. I call it spring training cause I'm baseball. I don't know if football yeah. calls it spring training. Yeah. I have no idea. I still call it that. Seahawks just started here uh, this week, actually. Wasn't there a game last night? Was there a game last night preseason? There might be. I, I thought, just came into town, so I, I thought the that. Raiders played. Oh, Raiders, somebody. Okay. I don't know. I didn't watch the game. I just heard football's back. Yeah. So that's uh, the other place I buy um, uh, properties is places where I like the football team. So Vegas, yeah. got a really cool stadium. Uh, and then Dallas. I'm not a big Cowboys fan, but you know, still, it's kind of fun to watch. I'd like to see that area. What Jerry Jones did to that area because that yeah. looks super cool. I mean, you saw the highlights, didn't they have the Super Bowl the, the year after it was done? Yeah. So you got some shots from the, the TV, yeah. at least, from what the area looked like. It looked awesome. It but, looks amazing. Yeah. man, the most expensive ticket prices, from what I hear, yeah. are yeah. in Dallas. But, I mean, you're basically going into this luxurious seven-star resort when you go to a football game. Yeah. yeah. I want to yeah. know what a burger costs down there. Well, I don't like think, you, I mean, you could order burgers to your chair, to your seat. And I think in that stadium, you might be able to even order like pedicures and manicures and foot massages and <laughs> like mid game, like mid second like, I mean, order. Just it's so little... bougie, you know, <laughs> that's awesome. Doesn't surprise me for what he built over there though. Yeah. It to offer those kind of services. 
I'm totally kidding, but that just that just kind of the sense I get with the ticket prices they offer. It's like, man, what is this thing? I know. I know. What's next down there for him? Yeah, that'd be crazy. Well, we definitely need to stay in touch because it sounds like we do a lot together, and and that'd be kind yeah. of cool to see if we could link in somewhere there. Uh, the Midwest is gorgeous, and in fact, just uh, yesterday I'm evaluating two single family homes uh, right in Michigan, and every time I I look up in that area, I'm just like, man, the prices up here are amazing. Yeah. I know we are talking about buying for a teardown. We bought one uh, a few blocks from where I'm at right now. And that one was um, about 350. Nice. And that's going to be a complete teardown. In that one, I was like, oh my God, we have to drop 350 just to tear it down to rebuild. <laughs> um, but I mean, with the comp and what we're going to do with it, it's, it's worth it. But yeah. that was a tough one to swallow. So for you hearing 800 for a teardown, I'm like, that's what I want to be all in cost. Yeah. Yeah. Like no, it's, 100%. It's just the disparity of, of area, but obviously with Hawaii being more of a international market, you have a lot more buyers, a lot more competition. Like it's, it's going to happen like that. You see that in all the vacation spots. I mean, that's, what's taken us so long to get to Florida and Southern California. Yeah. Cause buying yeah. houses down there are just insane price, but. hundred percent. Well, I think with the recession, you know, potentially being here, and you know the market changing a little bit. I think there's going to be more opportunities to buy. Yep. And I think and that's that... where I just want to unload so I can be ready. Yes. And then I'm going to call you up and say, "Hey, meet me in Florida. We're going to drive Look. around and see who finds the first one." Let's do it. Let's do it. Yeah. And then maybe we'll go uh, go down to Dallas on the way back and uh, go check out a game. I would go back to Texas anytime. That's where our spring training was every year. So what was it? Okay. When we were in college, we'd go down to San Antonio every year and play oh, teams yeah. from across the country. And man, I heavily contemplated not coming back after my senior year and just staying down in Texas. What are it's, it's, it's a fun place and the market is so inexpensive. You know, the only part is the humidity there is a little nuts. Yeah, but I heard that they're, they don't have like zoning. So you can have a shopping center next to a single family home, next to a doctor's office. Like they, you build whatever you want, wherever you want. Just yeah. make sure it's in your lot. Yeah, it's the Texas Lone Star motto of we are our own country kind of a thing. And Lone yep. Rangers, yeah, they do They do some pretty crazy stuff over there. Yeah, like, and I want to be involved. It would be yeah. fun. Yeah, it is fun. It is fun. And it also makes you pull your hair out some days. But <laughs> you know, true. at the same time, you're just like, hey, that's just how it goes. But that the neat thing true. about being in different markets is that you really get to diversify uh, the understanding of real estate because yeah. everybody does it different. And, and it's yeah. a lot of fun. Yeah. No, that's cool. Well, yeah. we're definitely going to have you back on. I feel like we just got to know like who you are and what you do. I want to dive into like, how did you build this stuff and what were the, the, the pain points and what flowed and what was good and bad. And um, we, we couldn't even get into those, those kind yeah. of questions with what we got going on. So yeah. we'll definitely have to have you back. Um, hopefully, I don't know where we're at with scheduling wise, but uh, we're going to officially start the competition to get to Florida first. Oh, okay. So as we get onto the next show, we'll see who has come closer or if, if someone's successful. Let's do uh, it. No, no, I wish you well. I think that'd be great. Or the other thing is you find a deal that we could do together. Let me know. Oh, I'm on to that one too. Yeah. That would be fun. Yeah. We're looking, we're looking at your flexible down there too. Multifamilies. We're looking at uh, uh, those motel concepts. Yeah. So I would definitely parks, like to get really, into that. Really interested in RV parks too. So if you see anything or hear of anything, they're so hard. They're hard. They're so hard to get into. I would love to own one, but yeah, I can't find one that some someone's selling. Right. And that two, yeah, that isn't uh, gonna can be converted already. Because right. I don't know how it is in Hawaii, but here you can't. I believe you can't build anymore. So the existing ones are the existing ones, and that's it. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, there's not there's none in Hawaii actually, but um. They there's, don't allow them or just no one's built them? Um, they're kind of just not really allowed. I mean, they're kind of allowed on small parts on like your own plot, but yeah. to build a mobile home in there, but there's not like a mobile home park. Yeah. You would think that there would be, but if you think about it, you'd have to ship those from the mainland too. Yeah. So it's pretty cost prohibitive. So you might as well build the house there, you know? Yeah, no, that's so. true. Yeah, yeah, but yeah, definitely. It's been a pleasure, and I can't believe we had an hour and we've only got started. But definitely, let's stay in touch for sure. And uh, Natasha's got all my details, and love to hear more about what you guys are doing as well. Yeah, and if if uh, we'll put in the show notes, 
what is the best way for people that are listening that are either in those markets or want to learn from you? What would be the best way for them to reach out to you? And then yeah. also a segue into your podcast. What is the podcast? Because I'm going to start listening. Gotcha, gotcha. So teamkekoa.com is our website. So T-E-A-M-K-E-K-O-A.com is our website. Okay. Uh, and and uh, you'll just kind of get a sense of all the things that we do. And the podcast is not so much a podcast. It is a coffee talk. It's just a coffee session that we just kind of come on and, and ask questions. So we can post the link to that too. Yeah, um, that'd be great. Really, we're available to anybody who just wants to brainstorm and, and it's always fun to meet people. I like, I love this, like having a nice conversation and meeting a new friend and then hopefully do some business together. Um, yeah, that, definitely. Awesome. Definitely. We'll get something going for sure. hundred percent, especially if it allows us to buy a house, like what you got behind you, let's do it right there on the I know. <laughs> We're yeah. getting there. The next one, uh, that teardown that was three fifty. the final sale price on that is going to be one five. Nice. So it's going to be, It'll be something like this once we're all done with it. That's awesome. That's awesome. It's beautiful. Yeah, a lot of work with this one, but yeah. we're ready for the next one. Right on. Yeah, keep going. If we can be of any resource, uh, let us know. Absolutely. I'll reach out soon. We'll, we'll get you back for sure, but we'll be talking again. Right on. Well, thanks, Marcus. Thanks, Natasha. You guys have a great one. You all too. Right. Yeah. Okay, take Talk care. Talk soon. Bye. Bye.